few minutes, but uh, you, uh, we don't want to wait and waste any minutes. As, uh, as you can see from the videos we showed you that we proudly uh, created ourselves, we are very excited about uh, this uh, webinar and this grant. I'll uh, share my screen for a very short uh, introduction before uh, leaving the floor to our speakers of today. Uh, you should uh, see my screen uh, well. Uh, stop me if it's that not the case. Um, so I am Anna Fakinaki. I'm country coordinator of Your Access China. That is one of the organizers of today's webinar. And I'm today here with uh, two colleagues of mine, Halder Berg and Vanessa Lee, that uh, maybe that will wave you from uh, their cameras. Uh, today's webinar is uh, focused on really a great opportunity that is open to Chinese researchers uh, and not only. Uh, I know that today with us we have also researchers from uh, Asia, uh, some from uh, the European Union and even from, from other parts in the world. So stay connected because this is really a great opportunity open to all of you uh, if you have a little bit of uh, experience in uh, research, but really there's a little bit uh, for, of, uh, for everybody with uh, uh, a lot of experience and already great achievements and also for those who uh, started their research career not too long ago. Uh, so uh, let me show you the agenda. Oh, 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 sorry, I skipped. This is the agenda. Uh, so uh, after a very short poll, uh, we have a few questions for you to understand better what you uh, expect from today's event. Uh, I will give the floor to Vaida Vanskat. I hope I pronounced your surname. It's very long <laughs> enough well. Uh, she is one of the two ERC scientific officers that will be with us today. And she will provide some insights about the application. And I know she also has some uh, interesting statistics specifically of uh, Chinese uh, applicants. So that I think is going to be very interesting. Then uh, I will give the floor to Professor Chao Zhang, who is uh, a Chinese ERC grantee. He successfully applied and is going to be very interesting, I think, to hear his experience in applying and in uh, taking advantage of the grant and of his experience into Europe, I think as well. He traveled around quite a bit. Then we will uh, uh, take a little bit of time for, for some questions. Uh, we have two Q&A session. On this first one, that is to be shorter, we focus on the first two presentations and then we will have a longer final one. Uh, before the presentation of our last speaker, who is David Innocenti, also from the ERC, and he will focus more on the implementing agreements uh, that the ERC has with uh, third countries, uh, and especially in this case with China, so that allows uh, Chinese researchers to also join uh, the, the, the research teams of the ERC. Uh, before uh, starting with the, with the main focus of today, I just want to spend a couple of words about your access China. For those uh, of uh, you who are not familiar with us, your access is an initiative uh, uh, led by the European Commission, it's pan European. Uh, there are more than 600 offices, they are in different uh, countries. Uh, in Europe. Uh, so if you are planning, uh, you're applying or you're moving to Europe, it's uh, also a great resource. And uh, there it has an international arm, your access worldwide. We represent your access China with an office in Beijing since 2009. So we have had the time to run uh, quite a few activities in these 12 years. Uh, what we do is basically to support and provide uh, services to researchers. Um, we do that through all different kinds of activities. Uh, we uh, provide information, we uh, organize events for networking, thematic uh, events. We help uh, identify new potential partners uh, in China and in Europe. And uh, uh, in general, we, we try to uh, make uh, uh, researchers 
uh, get to know each other. We work with uh, Chinese researchers that are in China and maybe are thinking and are willing to, to move uh, to Europe for a research career there. And we also work a lot with European researchers who already moved to China and we uh, organize uh, activities also for, uh, for them in China. You see the QR code to follow us on, on WeChat on the bottom of my slide. Let's see if I can move to the next one. Uh, this uh, is the QR code to join uh, the WeChat group that we created specifically for our uh, webinar of today. And uh, uh, so after the webinar ends, uh, we are happy to continue the discussion in the WeChat group. If you have further questions uh, or you want to drop us a message, uh, you need a link to uh, some, uh, some uh, informational resources that were mentioned to the webinar, we are happy to help. We are not experts, but in case we can redirect you to someone who is. So join the WeChat group if you want to stay connected after. And uh, please take our poll. It's just a few questions uh, to understand better who is with us today. We have more than 100 participants already. So you can do it with your phone by scanning the QR code or clicking on the link that you find on the bottom of the slide on Menti. And uh, uh, let me see if uh, uh, we can start uh, with that. I'm going to uh sorry about that. It's my PowerPoint that sometimes freezes. Uh let's uh, move to the poll and see if someone uh someone already started answering the questions. So the first one, where are you from? Okay, uh, we have, uh, uh, you can see we already have uh, some who are not Chinese. Uh, let's move already to the second one. Where are you currently based? Uh, I assume that most of our participants are based in China today, but uh, uh, we have uh, one from Europe for sure. Uh, okay. Well, half and half. I see not many of you are participating to the poll. I hope I gave you enough time to scan the QR code. I see only four of you, but let's move anyway, because I don't want to waste too much time. But please uh, take us to this one. Who are you? Scientist, researcher, student, someone who is only interested. I see three researchers. Okay, so potentially all uh, uh, applicants for uh, future grants, a student as well. And this is the last one. How familiar are you with the European Research Council? Uh, we always uh, say, and we have been saying through these years that the European Research Council is really a great opportunity. It's considered very prestigious uh, grant uh, that you can win uh, in Europe, but we got to learn that it's not very, very known among Chinese researchers and in China in general. So I can see that uh, our, um, our expectations were probably met as, um, most of you are saying uh, that they know a little bit of the European Research Council, but not very familiar, or someone is not familiar at all. So I guess that uh, our uh, webinar of today even has uh, uh, more meaning <laughs> against this background. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen. And this was the end of, of my poll. So I'm, I'm very happy to give the floor to Vaida, who is our first speaker. And uh, so we got to, to the heart of, uh, of our webinar of today. Vaida, good morning. I see you're already sharing your screen. Good morning, Anna. Can you, can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, it's loading for me. I think you're uh, making it uh, uh, 
full screen now. So, so good morning uh, or afternoon, everybody. I am very happy to, to be part of this great event. Um, I have been working for the European Research Council for nearly 12 years from very beginning. And, and as a scientific officer, I participated in many evaluation meetings. I participated in, in many interviews. And I, I am hoping that with my presentation and with my sharing of my experience, I will be able to encourage you to apply to the European Research Council. Uh, so European Research Council, it's about individual researchers from all over the world. And the European Research Council offers a long-term grants up to five or six years. And we are looking for innovative research in all uh, science areas, such as life sciences, physical sciences and engineering, and social sciences and humanities. After more than 11 years now, since European Research Council was established, we can consider that it, it has been a success. Uh, in Europe and all the world, it's uh, highly recognized by the research community. It has been already mentioned that it became prestigious funding scheme and uh, around 11,000 top researchers uh, were funded. Um, now, uh, the majority, around 70% around of researchers funded, they are at early career stage. And we have very broad of a scope of nationalities, more than 80 nationalities researchers were, are funded. And of course, it's highly competitive. So, sorry it's, to inter interrupt, uh, Vaida. It seems that uh, there is a, a black uh, bars on the screen, which uh, that, uh, prevents uh, the, the audience actually to read the slide. And, uh, we can see they already have a lot of comments actually in the chat. So maybe you can reshare again. And uh, I think that would be helpful. I can try. Uh, Is it better now? Um, I think no, it, it's the same. And it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit worse than when we tried in, before. Do you want me to share it for you? Uh, yeah, maybe. Now it's better. And, and now, is, is it better now? Uh, uh, I, 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 like this, uh, um, there is one of the black box just, you know, it's on the corner. There is just a, a smaller one that covers part of the title, no? the the orange title. After more than, and then there's a, yeah. Is it is it better now? Sorry. Yes, like I I think we can no, go no, on like this work. Yeah. because it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's okay I guess. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so sorry the sorry about that. So I as I had mentioned, it's it's um. It's a competitive funding scheme. However, if it's uh, if if succeeded, it, it provides an enormous amount of opportunities. Um, A European Research Council has the Scientific Council, uh, which is composed of 22 renowned uh, scientists, and uh, they, they established the whole scientific strategy at the European Research Council. Uh, uh, the new president of the Scientific Council, Professor Maria Lepton, will start uh, working from 1st of November. So European, uh, the Scientific Council, uh, also ensures communication of scientific community and controls the quality of, of, um, of the operations. Uh, however, we have also executive agency where I work and together with 400 colleagues and, and we, uh, we organize the evaluation, we organize the calls, we also monitor the projects once uh, the, the grantees uh, start uh, their project. 
Now, at the European Research Council, we have three co-funding schemes. And these are starting grant. Uh, so it's up to, the applicant can ask for one and a half million. Duration is five years. And the, the applicant who has from two to seven years of experience after the PhD studies can apply. Then there is a consolidated grant. Uh, the size of the grant is up to two million, a duration five years and the, who can apply. So these the researchers who have from seven to 12 years of experience after completion of their PhD studies. And advanced grant, uh, the applicant can apply up to two and a half million euros. Uh, again, duration is five years. And any excellent uh, researcher uh, can apply to, 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 this, to this funding scheme. Uh, and the a track, track record of achievements of the last 10 years will be evaluated. It's because uh, at the ERC, we want to fund active researchers. That's why uh, it will be looked at the last 10 years of um, scientific um, experience. Now, in all these three schemes, uh, researchers can, uh, can ask and request one uh, extra million if there are specific conditions fulfilled. A additional ERC funding schemes are synergy grant, and this uh, funding scheme is given to the group of researchers from two to four researchers and their research groups. And the size of the grant is up to 10 million euros uh, and duration uh, maximum is six years. In the synergy grant, which is important and interesting for, for Chinese applicants, is that one researcher can be based outside European Union or associated country. Uh, then we also have proof of concept, and this is scheme is uh, devoted for already ERC grantees uh, who want to put the results of the ERC project to the market. And duration is 16 months, and size of the grant 150,000 euros. Now, uh, as it was already mentioned, that uh, researchers from all over the world can apply to the European Research Council. Uh, of course, uh, what are these opportunities? As I mentioned, the additional startup funding for researchers moving to Europe, so it's 1 million euros irrespective of call scheme. Uh, grantees can keep affiliation with home institute outside Europe. So we, we, it's possible to have dual affiliation. Uh, if, if at least 50% time uh, is provided in Europe and working on the ERC project. While team members of the ERC grantee can be outside Europe 100%. Uh, another thing which is very uh, appreciated, which is highly appreciated by, by the grantees is that grantee can move within Europe with the grant. So we, we have this more portability of the grant. Uh, if uh, one institution provides better conditions or, or, or something else changes, uh, it's possible to move the grant to another institution within Europe. In terms of a ERC evaluate proposals uh, from grantees, uh, from, from applications, uh, from applicants uh, with nationality, Chinese nationality. Here are some statistics. So in, from 2007 to 2020 calls, very recent, uh, you can see how many applications were evaluated at the European Research Council. And these applications came from China nationals. You can see that the biggest part of the applications were uh, was submitted to, to starting grant call, which is 542 applications out of more than 700. And uh, out of these, the biggest part went to physical sciences and engineering. Now, when it comes to the uh, which e grants were awarded by the ERC to China nationals by call and scheme, you can see that in total there are 53 grants which were awarded to uh, China nationals. And uh, again, the, 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 the highest number 
come to starting ground, uh, followed by consolidated 13 grounds and one at one ground. And a similar numbers that uh, the highest number of awards were given to physical sciences and engineering domain, in total 27. A number of Chinese uh, principal investigators uh, ba based in China at the time of application were um, 24 out of uh, 721. Uh, and three of them were successful. So that means that the biggest majority of, um, of Chinese principal investigators, when they applied, they, they were not based in, in, in China. So when it comes to the host institutions and, and countries where Chinese grantees are chosen, you can see that the, uh, the biggest, the highest number in, in Germany, followed by the UK and then Netherlands and, and Sweden. So, so these are the countries where Chinese um, uh, principal investigators uh, are working now. I would like to present you the next year calendar for the for our calls in uh, for where you can submit applications. So for starting grants next year, the call um, uh, the call is open and the submission deadline is the 13th of January next year. For consolidated call, uh, the uh, it will be applications will um, submission will be open in October, and submission deadline is the seventeenth of March. For advanced grant calls, uh, it will be open in January, and the submission deadline will be April. For synergy calls, uh, the submission deadline will be in November. And proof of concept, you, there are several uh, calls uh, which, which will be open with different deadlines. At the European Research Council, we have so-called review panels. And uh, in life sciences, we have nine review panels. And in social sciences and humanities domain, there are seven review panels. And in physical sciences and engineering, 11 review panels. Uh, so if you decide to apply to the European Research Council, you have to choose one of this um, review panel where you want your uh, application to be evaluated. Uh, for more information about these uh, review panels, you can find, uh, you can look and, and you can find in Guide for Applicants or our work program. So there you can see, uh, you can see a more detailed description of each review panel. So to, uh, and then you can see where your project proposal fits better. I would like to speak uh, to present the, how uh, proposals at the ERC are evaluated. Uh, so we have a single submission, but uh, evaluation takes um, in two phases. We call them step one and step two. So the applicant has to write the, a, a short synopsis, but also a full proposal. So in step one, uh, uh, the synopsis and curriculum vitae will be evaluated only. Uh, it will be evaluated by panel members. Each review panel has between 13 and 16 panel members. So these uh, panel members remotely will evaluate the, the synopsis of the proposal and CV. Then the, the, going to, the panel meeting takes place where all submitted proposals are discussed and the uh, proposals are scored into B, or Cs, these proposals uh, are not participating anymore in the next set of evaluation, and the proposals which receive A uh, score, they are retained and they pass to the next step of evaluation. So uh, in, in step two, there are three times, up to three times of proposals, which at the end will be funded. So again, a, a panel member, but also external reviewers who are specialists in the field, they look at full proposal, which is, we call it part B2. It's up to, up to it's uh, 17 pages of, of document and they evaluate these, uh, these documents remotely. And then we have panel meeting and interviews. The successful applicants uh, who passed to step two, they are invited 
uh, to, to, to the interview, they, they, they ask to present briefly the project and then they, um, it is a question and answer session. And uh, then uh, this, during this panel meeting, after the all interviews take place, uh, review panel members, they decide which proposals then are funded. Contrary to what you may think, uh, ERC funds frontier research, but also applied research. So ERC doesn't have any predetermined topics. So any topic you may want to explore, or any area you want to you want to work on, it's welcome at the European Research Council. The budget uh, is distributing amongst the scientific panels as a function of demand. That means that the success rate is equal. Uh, there is no uh, there is there, there is no chance that in one panel will be success rate will be higher than in comparison with other. Uh, as I mentioned, the panel descriptors, they do not represent ERC scientific priorities. Any topic is welcome to the ERC um, uh, funding. And the host institution is not an evaluation criterion. Evaluation process, uh, I would like to emphasize that excellence is the only evaluation criterion at the European Research Council. And by that, we look at excellence of the research project uh, European Research Council wants to fund innovative groundbreaking research uh, with a, a high impact. We also look forward to high risk, high gain proposals and innovative scientific approach or feasible scientific approach. And when it comes to excellence uh, of the principal investigator, of course, the intellectual capacity, creativity and commitment is appreciated. If you decide to apply to the European Research Council, you are, you are encouraged to look at the, our website where you can find ERC funded projects. Uh, you can look at uh, by the funding scheme, a call year, domain or panel, and you, will, you can get a better idea of which kind of research uh, is funded at the, at the European Research Council. So uh, there are some rumors which would like to uh, tell that not, they are not always true. So for example, uh, you can only apply for the NRC grant if you are highly accomplished scientist, which is not necessarily the case because at the European Research Council, which is evaluated is an uh, accomplishment of the applicant in relation to the stage of seniority. So if the, it will be looked differently, the, the applicant uh, who is maybe three years after the PhD in comparison with someone who is seven years after the PhD. Because of course, we expect the output of these uh, applicants uh, be different. Um, now, the rumors that to be success, successful, you need to continue on an established re research line to pr prove continuity and credibility. Actually, it's not the case. It's very highly appreciated at the European Research Council if the applicant uh, gets to take a new research line and uh, uh, goes to multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary research. So uh, at the ERC, we want to have um, groundbreaking research and incremental research is not really appreciated. Now, if you have already obtained an ERC grant, you are less uh, or more likely to get, to get another one. It is not true. Uh, panels are instructed, review panels are instructed to look at the proposal uh, on its own merit and in comparison with the other applications uh, which are submitted in the same panel. Uh, so, yes. Uh, so. Particular emphasis is put on frontier science, scholarship, or engineering, and multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary proposals, and uh, very innovative proposals, which address new and emerging fields of research. Proposals which uh, introduce unconventional or innovative approaches and scientific inventions. So where you can find more information about our funding schemes, uh, in our website, 
And uh, we, I would also um, advise you to look uh, specifically created videos. Uh, they called ERC classes, and and there are several of these videos, and I think they are very useful, very well done, and you can get information that what you consider before applying, how. To to fill in the application, part B1, part B2, very practical uh, advices. You can also get information about the interview and also how the evaluation process works at the ERC. Here is more, uh, uh, here's more website and our, our social media channels. With this, I would like to thank you for, first of all, for organizers for having, for inviting me and for, for this opportunity to speak about my, my work and my job. And I also to like, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Ready uh, to answer questions, what you may have. Thanks a lot, Vaida. It was uh, very interesting and you also provided some very interesting, uh, you know, uh, information about Chinese applicants uh, that I think it's uh, you know it's very valuable for for our audience today uh, before uh, opening for questions uh, I would like to proceed with our second speaker so we hear the testimony from Professor Chao Zhang and then uh, we will have a 20 minutes about 20 minutes Q&A session also by your presentation we are already receiving questions that are directed to you and uh, I uh, encourage uh, our participants today to uh, keep asking questions through the chat box because we are collecting them. And during the Q and A session, we will uh, uh, we will bring those uh, questions uh, to you and uh, to the speakers. So, <clears throat> thank you, Vida, for your presentation, uh, Professor Chao Zhang. Can I invite you uh, to? to for your presentation. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Anna. So I'm going to share my screen first. So can you see my slide? Yeah, we can see that and we can hear you very well. Great. So yes, so uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the invitation. And uh, I'm very happy actually to attend this uh, your Iraqis uh, China events to let more Chinese research and also other researchers to know about the, uh, the ERC. Uh, so my name is Zhang Chao. So I'm an associate professor at Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, so as you can see from the, the title of my talk today, it's called the, the Journey to the West. So, well, this is, I took this title from this uh, famous story about the Monkey King, right? So Monkey King uh, had, uh, this adventure with uh, his uh, master Shifu and uh, his uh, fellow disciples, and uh, and what about my uh, adventure? So here is uh, my scientific uh, trajectories. So I I was trained as a material scientist uh, back to China, and then after that I got an uh, Erasmus Mundus scholarship from the European Commission which uh, supports me to, to do actually a master's study in Europe. So it starts first in France, and then actually I did my uh, master's thesis project in Italy. And then after that, I started actually my PhD in Italy as well. And then uh, my supervisor decided actually to move the group to Germany, which I followed. So after I finished my PhD in Germany, I had a brief postdoc also in Germany, and during that period, which I obtained uh, a research fellowship from the, the German Research Foundation, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. And uh, so with that support, I spent the three years uh, in UK, in Cambridge, for doing a uh, postdoc research uh, before I landed as an assistant professor in Sweden uh, in 2017. And then in this year, just right before the summer, I get uh, I got promoted to be an associate professor. So that is uh, uh, kind of uh, my experience. And uh, I think this experience sort of gave me a pan-European view about the research environment and uh, also the, the research culture. So, uh, so we are a young group, which consists of uh, four PhD students and one postdoc. 
So we work on the atomistic modeling of uh, electrolyte materials and the electrified solid liquid interfaces. So these sort of systems are fundamentally important to energy storage systems such as uh, batteries, supercapacitors, and the fuel cells. So uh, as sortation, on one hand, so we develop new uh, simulation techniques such as uh, the final field mark dynamic simulation, as well as the atomic machine learning code uh, called PAIN. And on the other hand, uh, we collaborate uh, with our local experiment colleague who are working on uh, polymer electrolyte. And also we are actively seeking a new collaboration with the experimentalist who are working on uh, the metal oxide uh, services. And with that, it brings to uh, my ERC project, which is on the deep magnetic modeling of electrified metal oxide nanostructure. So the goal of the project is actually to divide, uh, develop the new uh, simulation techniques, uh, both based on the physics-based uh, modeling and also machine learning-based modeling to, uh, to actually look at the electrochemical interfaces. So as you can see from the, the left side of the, the panel, it uh, tells you actually the timeline of my application. So I start have the idea actually to, to apply for ERC uh, at the at very beginning of 2019. And then during the summer in 2019, uh, which uh, luckily in Sweden, basically we actually have two months, which uh, you're free from the teaching and the rest of things. So which I can actually can kind of start to look into the literature and uh, you know write down the summaries, then collect them actually to assemble a uh, first draft of the proposal. And then in the September 2019, I attend an ERC workshop, which organized by the Uppsala University, which was very helpful because it gave you an overview about the, the components of your applications. And also they actually invited the a past uh, ERC grantee, which actually shows you the, the tapes and uh, which you actually can use to polish your, your proposal. And then after that, the proposal was submitted in, uh, October 2019, and then about uh, six months later, I got an email from ERC, which tells that I passed the first step. And then because, uh, because as you know, last year was uh, the, the pandemic was uh, the most severe, and uh, because of that, uh, we don't really have an interview, uh, which means that I actually got the notification directly around the, the end of the, the July last year. And uh, I still actually remember that when I got this email, it doesn't actually tell you, say, a congratulation, right? It tells you that uh, your, your application is fully evaluated by the panel and the reviewers. And then they decide actually to return your, your proposal within the pool. This is the kind of formal language of the notification, which uh, at that point, I didn't really convince myself. Actually, I got a grant. So you really have to log into the portal and then download all the evaluations. And then after I read all these eight uh, referee reports, then I am sure that actually they support my application. So that was a great uh, positive surprise. And then after a few months later, uh, there is some uh, administration works to actually finalize the grant agreement. And, uh, and then from the beginning of this year, the, the project uh, officially, uh, officially started. And so the first peer student who, who is hired within my year C just started uh, starts, just started her PhD from the beginning of this month. So this is uh, the sort of my year C application in a nutshell. And then of course, uh, uh, I mean, if you are an applicant, uh, the first question you ask yourself is when I'm ready actually for year C grants application. So here I will focus on the starting grants because uh, the consolidated grant is uh, is a bit different. It's already assumed you have and lead a group. So for the ERC starting grant, uh, here is something which I take from my experience, also my exchange with my other colleagues. So I think the first important thing is that you you need to already have done something important actually during your postdoc time, without involving your PT supervisor. So this is very important to actually show you start to. Uh, demonstrate uh, scientific independence. And the second, of course, when you start to write a grant application, you will for sure look at what you have published before. And uh, then you will wonder whether you need, what do you actually need to really support your application? So uh, 
And then uh, there one thing is, of course, I mean, uh, if you have a, a high impact uh, publication uh, in some uh, very prestigious journals, this will be a plus. However, one have to bear in mind that this varies between different fields. So you really have to know in your specific field what will be a good track record. And uh, also you should uh, know that. So the ERC, they really have no problem to find out the most suitable referees or the reviewers to evaluate your proposal. So they are really someone who will read your paper, not just to see where you publish. In other words, it's actually more important you actually have high impact work rather than let's say uh, the high impact journals. So this is one thing I guess uh, as applicants, you need to know that. And another thing is because uh, uh, they would actually to see uh, how much really you contribute to the work which you publish. In other words, you need to provide actually the evidence to support the, the referee to judge, I mean, uh, how much actually scientifically you, you contribute to work you have published. So one of the tip which I give you is that if you, if you start actually to have a group, then it's very good that you can actually publish with your students to demonstrate that you actually can supervise students and which provide actually the evidence show that you actually can lead a group if they actually give you the grant. So if you don't really have a, a group or you don't have students actually working with you, then another way actually to demonstrate your scientific independence and ex excellency is actually to, to publish a single author paper. Because then actually the referee and also the panel will know that you actually did everything. You write the paper, you have the ideas, and you actually perform the research. So then they know as to you are the person. So this is from the perspective of the ERC. And then from your perspective, I mean, when, when should be the time which you feel that you're ready to apply for ERC? I think is that you have a clear idea about what you want to do next. Because uh, it's not just about uh, to apply for a big lump sum of money, right? Because you really need to think about why you need this money. So what you actually can you achieve using this money, which you cannot achieve by yourself? So this question has to be clearly thought through. And then if you have a good answer for this, then I think you will have a good idea about how to write up your proposal. The next question is how to prepare an ERC proposal. So the, there are a few tips which I'd like to give you. The first one is to start early because the ERC is a, a big proposal because you have the B1, B2. So B1 will be five pages and B2 is 15 pages. So it's a, a project by its own. Um, and because of that, you also need support from uh, both your host institutions and also your close colleagues. And, uh, and then if you read the guideline of ERC, the ERC would like to support this so-called high risk and the high gain. So what does it mean? Because it's, uh, I mean, as a first time applicant, you will always wonder what that actually is for its mean. So here is my take about uh, what it means like high risk. So I think high risk means, which means uh, so you have a research topic and no one actually have a clear idea about how actually to solve this problem. But then according to your background, you actually might have a shot. So this is defined for me as a high risk project. But then there is something which you also need to know is, this is a high controlled risk, which means uh, you need to have a plan B actually. So of course, if everything works, you reach the sky, that's great. But what if you didn't actually get what you're supposed to get? And then you also need to actually to show to the reviewer and, and also the panel that, you have things through about your project, you know actually which you will end up if you didn't actually achieve the highest goal. So this is uh, what I mean about controlled risk. And then the next question is how to better prepare an ERC proposal. So here are another few tips I wish I'd like to give you. The first one is to, to read the project summaries from the ERC website of successful project in your field. So this is already like a wider show one slide, which uh, provides the list uh, clue. So you actually, this is, you can just go to the ERC website and then go to the a page which lists the funded project. So you can actually uh, look at the project which were funded in your field. And by looking at these some project summaries, then you will have an idea about what kind of project is actually funded by ERC. And, uh, and then it's actually provide uh, you an idea about what uh, kind of projects uh, you would like to write. 
And uh, another thing is uh, you should uh, also check out who are sitting on the panel. So this is again the public information you actually can get from the RC website. The reason to know who are sitting on the panel is not to suggest you to contact any of the panel members, but instead it's about uh, to know your audience, right? Because when you write up this application, you would like to know what kind of the jargons, the terms, the language you'd like to use, the styles. So by knowing your audience, you actually can shape your proposal to better actually to, to let your audience know what you want to do. This is the, the point. And then the third one of my tape is uh, to try to follow the successful uh, proposal, the styles. So we all know that the happy families are the same and the unhappy ones are unhappy on its own reason. So which means if you actually can, if you can actually can have a look of a successful proposal, then it actually tells you a lot. So even it's from a different field, you actually have an idea about why this proposal is good and what is actually needed to have a very balanced proposal and, uh, and which have uh, thought through many aspects which you might actually missed before. And then the next question is uh, how to prepare an ERC proposal as a Chinese researcher. So this is uh, specific for my uh, fellow countrymen. And uh, because of that, I'm going to actually talk about this part in, in China instead. So, uh, so that's your Zhu Yi that's the ERC in a Shi Shang, Ta Shi, Ta Putin in Shi Kajin, Ta Shang Shi Kajin Tai Jifa, Ta Shi Shang Shi Ojo Tui Jung Yali in Tai Jifa. In Sid Huan, Shi Shang Ojo the Nick Gao Shang to ERC the the Hot Virgin, Shang Dosh Fiang Jung Shi. Yarsi的那个基金的话呢，它一般会为你提供一个 他之后的潜力以及他这个项目的潜力 因此这是非常就是说大家需要就是说是一个非常有利的一个一个条件。更广泛的一个认同是这样的so uh, with that said, uh, I, I wish all of you actually have good luck for your applications. And thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much to you for sharing your experience. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's always great. If I was to apply for an ERC grant, I would really look uh, for like to hear the experience of someone who applied successfully. So I think it's really great value. And uh, it was also great to hear your experience uh, really all around Europe. Uh, is the, you know, it's, I think, uh, you know, the distances you traveled maybe are not uh, as large as the distances that we have in, from different cities in China, but uh, the research culture and the, you know, the, the places you visit uh, are really very different from each other. So. Uh, I would like to ask you which one you like the most, but I will refrain myself to do so because, 
we have a lot of questions that we received uh, uh. also regarding Vida, Vida's presentation. So um, we already collected some of them. Uh, so we start from those. Uh, if we have later, we might even uh, allow the participants to be unmuted and to ask a question directly to our speakers if they want to do so. But uh, let's start. So uh, the first question we received uh, was uh, uh, from someone who is asking if uh, is that the case that uh, the only grant that can be used outside of Europe, uh, so for example, at a Chinese uh, institution is the synergy grant. And uh, if uh, um, for this application, uh, uh they need to have a collaborator laboratory that is based in europe um i think maybe i will direct this i will try to answer and if i misunderstood and maybe someone can correct me so for synergy one out of the two or four principal investigators can be outside europe but only one right and the rest uh, they have to be based in in, in europe um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, it, uh, there are re re requirements to spend at least 50% of time and work on the project uh, in Europe. So it's 50%. Uh, that's a requirement. So if the person may have a double affiliation, working 50 time, part of 50% of time in Europe and 50% uh, in China, for example. Uh, it can happen. Uh, it's 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 quite challenging, uh, but uh, it's a requirement to be based in Europe. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. So the short answer is that yes, <laughs> you need to be based in Europe. And uh, okay, another question, uh, which is about the ERC starting grant, uh, and is uh, from a person who uh, actually uh, wanted to start uh, um, his or her application. He's saying that uh, uh, this person found a host institution for the ERC starting grant, but uh, um, this person has been discouraged uh, to apply for it. Uh, uh, saying uh, that um, the institution is suggesting to apply for the postdoctoral fellowship, so a completely different kind of funding opportunity uh, to move to Europe because uh, this person doesn't have a CNS publication. And she's asking for a suggestion, what to do? To go forward and try to apply or follow the, the host institution's recommendation? I mean, I you can take up this I, I, question. I, yeah, please, please go <laughs> yeah, ahead. Of course, Veda can, yeah, go ahead. I think it's difficult to, to suggest without knowing more detailed information because I, I fully agree what the professor said about that, you know, uh, it's not, we, we don't expect the starters to have uh, nature science and everything so so it depends uh, it, 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 it it's very difficult to answer uh, yes or no in this uh, complex situation i think yes so the, the thing which i can add on this question is uh uh so the host institution might actually have an experience about uh, what the profile applicants would have a higher successful chance but uh, of course, it's, uh, they are not sure. Therefore, if you are convinced you're actually already good enough, then you should actually might find a good, a different institution to apply, which want to support you. So this is one thing. And second, you should also understand the other sides of the story, which is uh, if you applied right now, you get a C, for example, then you will not able to apply next year. Because the DRC actually have uh, this about the rule about uh, the, according to the score of your first step, whether you can apply next year or not. So you should also consider that aspect. And then, of course, the after to sort through these things, you can decide whether you want to go this round or not. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. I think uh, we provided some, uh, some few inputs uh, to this person, even if the final decision is, uh, is to him or her, <laughs> I guess. And then, uh, OK, we have a few, a few questions. Uh, that I grouped together and uh, that um, that I will read aloud because I think it's, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, fundamental questions that needs to be <laughs> replied immediately. Is like, uh, uh, 
um, are these grants open only to Chinese nationals? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, they are open to uh, researchers from anywhere in the world and any nationality. Uh, then uh, someone else is asking if the researchers is based in a university in China, but is not a Chinese national. Can he or still she apply? Uh, one question is specific about Switzerland. If it's eligible, it has a host institution this year. And uh, another person is asking again about the requirements regarding the principal investigator nationality and the location of the principal investigator's institution. I grouped these few questions together and uh, I leave uh, uh, one of you who wants to, to quickly answer them. I can answer. So any nationality, so you may be, you may have different nationality in China is you can apply to the ARC. So the same requirements apply that you, uh, that you have to be based at least 50% of your time in Europe. Uh, when it comes to Switzerland, uh, currently Switzerland uh, has not yet signed the, the agreement. Uh, so it's under the process. So for the time being, uh, I think we have to wait and see for the time being, if you can look for another host institution, maybe it's better, maybe more pragmatic, but we're still hoping that Switzerland will sign the, the agreement and, and we should know that. Yeah. Thank you, Vaida. So uh, let me just say it one more time. We are talking about, uh, you know, we're talking to especially Chinese researchers here because we are, you're ex China, we're based in China. So normally, a large part of our audience is formed by Chinese researchers, but these grants are open to anyone. So if you're not Chinese and you're part of this webinar, you did, you did very good in joining and, uh, and listening to, to this great opportunity. Uh, we have a few questions about the starting grant. Um, uh, there is someone who is asking, uh, so these grants are to be applied as a single principal investigator. So in, in case that, that this person wants to engage into multiple disciplines uh, the, and that these different disciplines, uh, they need uh, a postdoc or a PhD. How should the, the project for the application be organized? Uh, this person is asking if it would be possible to involve a seniority member uh, who also has a postdoc or a PhD, uh, and I guess who would also apply uh, for for a starting grant. Like uh, I guess combining uh, uh, the question is not super clear to me, but um, I guess this person is asking about combining uh, uh, applications for uh, a single project that requires multiple disciplines. I, I can try to answer. So, so, uh, so in case of multidisciplinary proposal, so the for starting grants, so the principal investigator, it's he or she only applies and looks for the collaborator. So, in the application, uh, you can clearly indicate who are going to be collaborators, why uh, the applicant needs them. Uh, what kind of uh, gaps and expertise are going to be covered, and uh, and and it's it's actually very good to do that uh, because then the the reviewers will see that um, that uh, all the expertise uh, is going to be to be to be there. So yeah, but but it's not so. But it's still single applicant who writes application, and uh, yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I think you answered uh, our question. Uh, we have. Um, let me group a couple of questions again about the starting grants. Uh, we have a person who applied last year and got a score B in the first stage, and is asking if it's still eligible to apply this year, or have to wait for the call in twenty twenty two. And, uh, and um, another person who is uh, uh, asking if uh, he or she is a starting ground holder that is still ongoing. Can this person already apply for a consolidator grant or for another ERC grant? And uh, let me add the last one that we received uh, uh, later. 
um, they're asking for starting grants, uh, are they uh, open for postdocs? And uh, if uh, this is the case, uh, how to manage uh, if uh, moving from uh, the present lab uh, to another uh, laboratory during the, the period of the funding? So, so the person who received uh, last year B in step one uh, have to wait actually one one more year. Uh, so, is it can apply in, in for twenty twenty two? So, yeah, because actually, if this person uh, didn't apply that, because we are now running the starting ground step two uh, evaluation. Uh, the person who holds already starting grants can apply to consolidate a call a grant, uh, but um, he or she will be able to start consolidate a grant only when he or she finishes starting grant. So we cannot have two grants running in parallel. You can apply to starting grants if you are postdoc. Um, it, it, it's okay. You as a, that, that's why it's a starting ground uh, is to help uh, the PI to establish uh, their own research group. So we have applicants who already have their own group, and we have applicants who don't have their group. And starting ground helps them to establish the group. Uh, how to manage the move from overseas to Europe? I, I think it's a challenging uh, task, but uh, we have applicants uh, frequently who come from the US and, and, and they establish in Europe and they um, uh, hire people to work in their group and, and they implement ERC projects. The one thing I can add to this is that uh, uh... Because, uh, because of the uh, prestige of the ERC, therefore, uh, uh, there are many actually European universities which are welcome actually to host ERC applications. And uh, which means uh, you should also try to select the best uh, host institutions which you like to work. And uh, they usually actually have a team to help you first to move and also actually to help you sort of prepare your proposal. So you should, I mean, if you really, decide actually to apply, you should uh, carefully select your host and uh, then work together with them for your application. Thank you, both of you. Um, we have a question. Um, I don't know if uh, it could uh, be directed to Chao. Uh, I think since you mentioned uh, like to look uh, and uh, follow the model of successful proposals, uh, someone is asking uh, uh, how to find the successful proposal samples. Yes. So this is the, so my own experience is to, so when I actually uh, talk with my colleague about the, to apply for ERC, so our uh, program professor, a senior colleague actually offered to his proposal, a consolidated grant proposal to me, which I, which is very helpful because despite it's a very different topic, right? I cannot borrow anything, but uh, you actually see the structure of proposal, you understand uh, why it actually looks good. So I think that's very helpful, but uh, this is the case which you have close colleague which like to provide such a thing. But if you don't, then again, I suggest you contact the host institutions. They might actually have some information on this, which they would like to provide you in order to help you actually to shape up your proposal. In, in this sense, it's actually very important for you actually to find a suitable host which would like to support you in many different aspects. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's a win-win situation if uh, you if you will succeed in the ERC grant. So it's in the best interest of your host institution to help you the way they can to to succeed in the application. And I see we have a few questions from people. I guess uh, worried about the success rate. <laughs> And um, someone is saying uh, that the success rate of Chinese applicants uh, looks uh, low, uh, about 5.7%, uh, lower than the average rate. And uh, they are asking if, it's, if that is the reason that Chinese applicants need to go through the interview in step two. And uh, let me also ask, um, um, add another question that is again, rela again related to success rate. Uh, someone is asking if there is any data available about the success rate uh, in step one and the step two for uh, starting runs. And, um, and yeah, let's go with these two first. 
Um, uh, I, I think lower success rate, uh, it only means that applicants uh, maybe had to, uh, maybe were less informed and maybe have uh, less experience in writing ERC grant. I would not uh, uh, think that there's something else here. And uh, I don't have now here the step one and step two data regarding success rate. You know, writing successful ERC grant requires time and efforts, and and it's um, it's a lot of work. And I I think maybe for for outside Europe, it's still less known, and and people have less experience in that. Yeah. Um, and please, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess, uh, of course, it's uh, it's because actually to have idea about the uh, success rates, but uh, you shouldn't uh, worry too much about this. This is statistics. I mean, uh, at your specific case, it's uh, average zero or one percent, right? One hundred percent. So, because when I actually applies, uh, even my very close colleague don't believe I will get it. This is truth, and uh, but it, but actually I got it, and uh, so so therefore this success rate is not. Uh, I would say that if you feel that this will be the right time to apply, and then you should you should go for that. And because I know that was actually my best shot, and I go for it. So, yeah, let me add that uh, you know it's uh, a lot of effort. Uh, maybe like uh, the percentage of success is low, but it's really high reward. So if you believe you're ready, if you you just need to believe in yourself and. Uh, you know, give it a shot. Don't uh, let the percentages uh, stop uh, stop you from uh, taking the chance uh, to engage in such uh, such an opportunity that could change your really you really your research career. Um, okay, let's uh, let's proceed. Uh, we have uh, just a couple of minutes uh, before the last. The presentation, our last speaker, and then we will have a longer QA session. So I will maybe just take uh, the last one or two questions. Uh, there is one that is asking if uh, there is any relation uh, and there is higher chance uh, to be awarded an ERC grant uh, if uh, the, the applicant already uh, was awarded uh, um, a funding uh, by the uh, European Union, for example, a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship. Is there a relation? Not, no, no, there is no relation. Uh, however, the, the, the review as a panel members, they look at the funding ID, uh, you know, which also there is uh, indicator for whether the applicant is independent and can secure funding so but there is no relation uh, direct relation with uh, with another eu funding great okay let's go for another very quick one um they're asking about the age limit for erc grant application and if it's possible to apply for more erc grants uh, at the same time there is no age limit there is no age limit so we, we look at the uh, professional age here so after the phd defense uh, two seven years and seven twelve years and then 10 years of active uh, last 10 years uh, active research for advanced grantees um uh, no you can apply only to one or one year c grant per year yeah yeah and i, I would add that even if it was allowed uh, probably wouldn't be really recommendable <laughs> since it's uh, you really need to, to to be focused to 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 be selected okay thanks a lot for taking these questions uh, we uh, we haven't finished all the questions that we received so far but i would like to continue and move uh, uh, to our uh, third speaker of today, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Davide Innocenti, who is also part of the ERC. He is an ERC scientific officer, and uh, he will focus especially about uh, uh, implementing agreements of the ERC. Uh, Davide, are you with us? Would you like to start your presentation now? Yes, thank you, Anna. I will uh, share my slides with you. I don't know if you can already uh, so see this. Everything is yeah, yeah, on. we see 
we see your slide uh, we can see and hear you well so i yes. will leave you the floor thank you uh so good morning from brussels uh, but especially good afternoon and uh, good evening for uh, most of you uh, i'd like to thank the access colleagues for the chance to present this european research council program fostering international participation uh, but above all, uh, uh, you that join us numerous today, and uh, you're still connected so late. Thank you. So it is a great opportunity for me uh, to, to, to present you uh, this ERC implementing arrangements. Um, as you will see, this is an opportunity to join an ERC team. Um, implementing arrangements are international agreements, promoting opportunities for scientists, uh, supported by third countries funding, funding agencies uh, to temporarily join a research team run by an ERC principal investigator. Um, so far, 16 implementing arrangements have been signed with funding agencies from 12 different countries, as you can see. New agreements are signed every year, and in particular in 2020, we had the new one with Japan and with uh, India. Uh, so, uh, more than 450 international researchers already visited an ERC project since 2012 through implementing arrangements. So we are talking about interesting numbers. And every year, uh, ERC uh, executive agencies launch an internal poll for expression of interest uh, to ask our PIs uh, for their availability to temporarily host an international research. Uh, next call uh, will be launched on November uh, of this year. Mm, as you can see, this is the list of the 16 third country funding bodies already participating to the program. And uh, all uh, the implementing arrangements that have been signed so far with the Commission, by the Commission and the relative third country research institution and ministries are already uh, available on the ERC additional opportunity to web page. Uh, you find the link below. I will share with you the link again at the end of the of the of the presentation. Um, as you can see, one agreement has been signed with uh, Chinese find, finding body, funding body in 2015, uh, the National National Science Foundation of China. Um, but how, how does it work? Uh, I will quickly guide you through all the process. Uh, every year we launch an internal call for expression in interest, as already mentioned, uh, contacting all our eligible PIs. The ERC PIs has one month to express their interest. And after the call is closed, uh, we send the list of interest PIs to third country funding agencies. Uh, at this stage, the ball is within the third country uh, based funding agency and the researcher, of course. The, the, the agency launched their own internal call uh, with different modalities. Uh, they will inform all the eligible researchers uh, that as applicants have to contact an ERC PI to, see, to seek an agreement on a possible research visit. The ERC PI can accept or not the research visit, of course. If accepted, uh, the PI and the host institution will provide you a letter of support. At this point, the third country based funding agency will evaluate uh, your proposal and then uh, with, they will fund the successful one. Uh, if you are funded, of course, you will have to plan and execute the research visit uh, in agreement with uh, the ERCPI. Um, there are a few participation, participation process and condition which are common to all the 16 agreements. Uh, I will quickly provide you some of this. So the, we at the ERC executive agency will not interfere in the communication between the ERC PIs and you as potential visitor. And of course, we will not intervene in the selection uh, process uh, done by the third country uh, funding body. Uh, of course, the visit has to take place within the lifetime of the ERC project. Uh, and this is expected that the collaboration uh, will occur in similar areas of scientific interest. Um, the visits, the visitors, the visiting researchers can be incorporated in the research team uh, of the ESCPI. 
for the duration of the visit, of course. Um, so I presented you the general structure and processes and the main condition. Uh, now I want to update you on the state of play of the program. First of all, uh, how ERC principal investigators received the implementing arrangements. As you can see, in 2012, the United States Science Foundation signed the first arrangement. And since then, hundreds of ERCPIs immediately welcomed the program. Um, thousands of ERCPIs already expressed their interest to host researchers funded by any of these third countries. And uh, this number of growing uh, in the last years, exceeding uh, an average of 600 participation in 2020. This means that the program is concretely providing to researchers by it, uh, funded by third countries, research institution, uh, an opportunity to pursue research collaboration with top scientists funded by ERC. But how this uh, translate in terms of uh, accomplished research visits? Um, since 2012, almost 500 scientists visits already uh, near CPIs teams. Um, temporary joining this team on a single long-term visits that can be or a multiple short-term or multiple short-term visit that can last uh, from between two and 12 months maximum. The number of visits grow uh, from 2012 uh, to a maximum of 100 in 2018. Uh, Despite all the difficulties due to the pandemics in the last two years, uh, provisory results are encouraging, considering as well that some of the funding bodies have to suspend or postpone uh, their campaign, their call for expression of interest because of mobility constraints, of course. Uh, as you can see, particularly important is the growth of China that in 2019 already surpassed 20 visits, summing up to a total of 60 uh, since the start of the program. Uh, and we are aware that for the last uh, and CFC internal call, uh, they receive a growing number of applications. More in detail, let's give a look to the details that uh, of these visits uh, to better understand what what is the nature of the of the scientific collaboration. Um, to do that, I, I can present you the the, era, um, the number of visits per destination country of visiting uh, uh, NS. FC researcher and, and by scientific domain. Uh, so far, NSFC, NSFC researcher visited the uh, ERC project in 17 European countries. Uh, of course, uh, it is expected that collaboration will occur in similar areas of scientific interest or on topic of mutual interest. And from this point of view, uh, you can notice that all scientific domains already are presented. Indeed, 71% of the Chinese researchers visited uh, a project of physical sciences and engineering domain, 20% a project in life science domain, and 7% a project in social, social sciences and humanities domain. Furthermore, one uh, Chinese researcher already visited a synergy project. In conclusion, uh, a vast and comprehensive collaborative offer uh, already translated in practical terms into hundreds of research collaboration uh, and involve hundreds of top researchers of every level of experience in Europe and across the world. And already a good number of Chinese researchers uh, take advantage of this opportunity. So I will leave you mentioning again the next call uh, for implementing arrangement, our internal call for expression of interest will be launched in November. Uh, meanwhile, the ERC executive agencies is providing uh, full support and information to all of you interested in this exciting opportunity of scientific collaboration. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thanks a lot, David. You really also added uh, an important piece uh, an extra, you know, extra element for for the especially for the Chinese uh, uh, potential applicants for these grants. So uh, I think we 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 arrived at the end of the presentations, uh, and uh, we have time to really open the floor to all the rest of the questions. I think uh, um, since we have a bit of time. 
if there is uh, anyone out there uh, among the participants uh, who prefer to ask a question directly to our speakers. Uh, so we'd like to be unmuted and maybe also show his or her face uh, to ask a question directly to uh, tell us. Uh, you can send us a message in the chat box uh, so we can unmute you and uh, yeah, and allow you for a more direct uh, way of interacting. Otherwise, uh, uh, just uh, just send us uh, questions through the chat box as you have been doing so far. Uh, my colleague Vanessa already told you if uh, someone is not um, uh, very comfortable asking in, uh, in English, uh, we also allow to ask the question in Chinese because all of our speakers speak very well Chinese. No, that was a joke. <laughs> Only one does. But uh, Vanessa will help us with the translation into English. And so, you know, we, we really want uh, everybody to feel comfortable asking any question because uh, we believe that these grants are a great opportunity and they are not known enough, especially among the researchers we work with. So don't be shy and ask your questions. Okay, so I'll continue from those that we received. Uh, there is someone who is uh, doing a postdoc in Finland. And this person is interested in applying for an ERC starting grant. Uh, and is asking if uh, the host uh, institute uh, for the ERC grant should be in another European uh, country other than Finland. A little bit like the mobility rules that we see for the Marie Curie uh, um, opportunities. Um, who wants to take this? I can answer it. No, we don't evaluate host institution. It's really your choice, your decision, and, um, and it doesn't need to be a different from your postdoc host institution. Yeah, thank you. We we have to make this clear. I think uh, in other webinars, uh, including the one that we had last week about postdoctoral fellowship, we stress the mobility rule, but these uh, are completely different funding opportunities. Uh, and uh, and there is no mobility rule that you just uh, apply with the institution that you think best uh, fit your project uh, and, uh, and therefore will be the best for your application. And um, okay, about uh, application for proof, proof of concept grants. Is it necessary to already have been uh, selected for an ERC grant, uh, another ERC grant, uh, before applying for the proof of con proof of con I'm sorry, proof of concept grant? Yes, a proof of concept is only for those who already have an ERC grant. And, and once you put the results to marketing or to patent or to commercialize. Yes, and that is the only funding scheme that requires this. All the others are open for, um, for anyone who didn't get an ERC grant before to apply. So uh, yes, okay. keep that in mind. Um, regarding the host again, uh, someone is asking if it's enough to just get in contact with the department of the host institution where um, he or she uh, will, uh, will make the project with, will apply with, or they need to identify a specific uh, supporting professor for the application. Uh, what we require is to provide a letter from host institution uh, accepting the, the, the future grantee to, to be in the, in, in, in the institution or university. So there is no need to find a specific professor. So we, what we, the requirements to have this letter uh, signed by the host institution. So Thank I you. can probably add something to this uh, regarding to finding a host uh, institution. So at least it really depends on university. I mean, for some universities, they are rather ambitious, which means they will have a university office specifically to support ERC applications. And then if you want to find a good host institution, I would suggest go to this kind of uh, universities, which did really drive actually to support you. So you don't really need to worry about administration aspect of the application. And, uh, and I, I know actually there are several of them actually across different countries in Europe, they're actually doing this. So, you, I mean, it's, it's actually not difficult to actually find the, a suitable one, and you should actually do that if you're interested to apply, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, okay, let's proceed. Uh, someone is asking uh, is if um, for an ERC grantee who is also applying for uh, some other national funding, uh, if, um, if the application for these other national funding is successful, and so uh, this person might have to reduce the time committed to the uh, ERC grant project. If that would be okay, if it would be possible to accommodate uh, this, uh, this situation. Yes, it's possible. Uh, it's it's a normal practice that applicants try different funding channels and they apply to different agencies. What is important is that, if, for example, in, in the ERC application, uh, the applicant mentions that uh, he or she applied already and maybe there is an overlap of these grounds. And, and we had cases when the applicants have to choose. They, they, they you know, even both funded and then they decided to choose or they or they um, decided not to pursue your C application when they received the national funding. There are different scenarios. And, and yes, the dedication, time dedication can also be reduced if needed during the implementation of the um, of the ERC project, uh, so the applicant, the grantee has to contact us. We have to look at the request, and it has to be discussion, but it's possible. Okay, yeah, I guess there is uh, a good level of flexibility, um, unless uh, you know you. I mean, you always need to prove able to to per pursue the the project you applied for. But um, but it's good to hear that there is a level of flexibility and. Uh, it's open uh, also, the situation is also open for other funding uh, funding opportunities. Um, okay, there is a, a someone who I think got a bit confused about the, the names. And uh, um, so let me just uh, clarify here that um, uh, we are talking about ERC grants. Uh, and uh, so like to apply for a grant, uh, you need to uh, write uh, a project and uh, therefore like ERC uh, principal investigator pro project uh, is a project that you uh, you write to apply for an ERC grant. And uh, so that, uh, that's, uh, that's what we are talking about. Uh, it's not two different kind of uh, funding schemes. Um, okay, we have uh, um, Another question that is about the feedback. The feedback received from the ERC after applying for, um, for a research grant. Uh, this person is asking if it's possible for you to speci specify the drivers of uh, failed projects. So this person is saying that from the presentation, uh, he learned that uh, uh, the projects uh, uh, fail uh, to, to be selected because they do not provide enough innovation and high impact up outputs uh, or rather than robust research experience uh, of uh, the principal investigators or, or because of other technical shortcomings, like style or formatting. So uh, he's wondering if it's possible for you to share more details about uh, basically the selection procedure and how not to fail. Sh shall I start? Well, it, it, it's, um, um, for example, myself, I am a coordinator in, uh, in life sciences domain, one of the panel. So for example, in life sciences, uh, the, the reviewers are looking for, um, for hypothe hyp hypothesis driven research. They also want to have preliminary data uh, to prove hypothesis and to prove feasibility. Uh, they also look that the scope uh, should be not too broad. So the, the project should be focused, uh, but not too narrow. So, uh, and, and um, not to disperse project. Um, so if, and innovative, of course. Uh, so as, as I mentioned several times, it should be innovative rather than incremental. Um, so if all these components are there, uh, it should be successful project. Now, when it comes to other areas, for example, social science, sciences in, in humanities, they may have a slightly different success drivers uh, because the domains are different. Uh, yes, I hope I, I answered this least partly. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the, I mean, this is a very difficult question to answer. What could be the, the reason the referee or the panel rejected the proposal? Of course, you, you, you will receive these comments if you get to the second step, they will actually have these written reports, which could be useful for your next application. But one thing I think very important is that uh, you need to ask yourself why this is a project which you are the person could do it, or you are the only one could do it. Because if you actually can answer this question, I'm quite sure this proposal might actually stand a chance. Because if the question, then the question is a good one, and you are actually the only one sort of have a, a good chance to do this, then they will support you. I mean, that, I think that's very logical. If I may add, it's actually a frequent question which uh, applicants receive in the interview, asking why you are the right person to do this thing. And an applicant really has to explain that maybe he or she invented a specific methodology, or maybe there's something so which has nobody thought about that. Yes, uh, that's correct. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's nice input. Uh, uh... It's the, I, I guess it's very hard to to give uh, tips on how to be successful, but uh, I I think uh, both uh, both uh, both of your answers uh, will guide uh, the applicants uh, in uh, in in a sort of way. And um, okay, I see one uh, probably last question uh, received in the chat box. And then uh, if anyone wants to ask a direct question, please uh, raise your hand or send a message. Uh, it's a good opportunity to have a more direct uh, sort of communication. Um, uh, I mean, we already touched this topic, actually. Um, there is a sweeping junk asking if the work or study experience in Europe give any limitation to the choice of the host institution. And uh, but let me let me say that we already we already talked about it. That there is no uh, limitation to the host institution you choose. You just need to uh, go for the one that you think is better for your project. And um, I I hope I didn't skip any of the uh, of the questions uh, that uh, that we received uh, in a written form. Um, if uh, there is any last question, yes. Um, yeah, may I ask a question? Please, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm a research from uh, University of Nottingham. And so uh, I made myself to the step two of this year's uh, starting grant. So uh, I, I'm just wondering uh, how important is the uh, interview performance? So uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I suppose that uh, we have a, a score in each stage. I mean, uh, do we have a score in step one, a step two, uh, external in, uh, external review, and also the score for the interview? So if yes, uh, how much is the weight of the uh, interview performance? Thank you. I, I may answer to, to this question. I can answer. So there is no score for the interview. Uh, so it's the, the it's still the, the score for, for the PI and excellence of the principal investigator and, and excellence of the proposal. However, interview is important because it's the it's the time where where all the questions and doubts uh, get clarified and and it's your chance to convince the reviewers, the panel members that you are the only one to do this project. And this is a fantastic project and, and with a high impact. And, and you thought about all um, alternative strategies if something goes wrong. And so this is your opportunity. So there is no specific score, but it's, it's, it is a very important uh, event. All right, thank you. Um, Anyone wants to add anything or anyone from the participants uh, wants to ask uh, a direct question? Uh, give you a few seconds. Uh, otherwise, uh, I hope I didn't skip any message, but I saw that uh, a lot of you joined our uh, WeChat group uh, and uh, we are happy to receive uh, more questions. And if we're not uh, able to, to reply to the questions, we will uh, redirect them to someone who is them. Okay, so I don't see any hand uh, moving. So um, I think we're getting close to the, the end of this webinar. Um, 
let me ask uh, our speakers uh, if you want to add anything. Uh, if uh, a question uh, wasn't directed to you, please say uh, say that now. Otherwise, uh, we have a very short uh, uh, survey that we would like our participants to take. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, so you can have access to the survey. It's uh, it's very important for us to have uh, your feedback. It's really uh, three or four questions. Uh, you can either scan the QR code uh, or again uh, click on this link. Uh, we will share the the results from the survey with uh, with the ERC, uh, so you know we can better for, perform uh, for you and for your colleagues who will want to apply in the future. And. Um, Okay, so please take the survey now or take it later. And uh, I, will leave, uh, I will leave the screen on while thanking uh, a lot uh, our speakers today. It was, uh, it was really great to have you. It would not be possible for us uh, to do such an informative uh, session with the pra practical information and even the testimony of someone who successfully applied without you. So really, thanks a lot for being with us, Faida, Ciao, and Davide. Uh, we will share the recording of this webinar and possibly also your presentation to all present uh, today. And uh, we will also share them on our website for those who couldn't join uh, the live session. Thank you, Anna. This is very nice, uh, your access China organizing this event. I think it was very useful for many Chinese applicants and also from other different countries. I hope so too. So thanks a lot for your time. Have, uh, have a good day in Europe and have a good rest of the evening to all, uh, all of those of you in China who, who joined us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anna, it's David. I I um, I will send you the updated slides. Okay, great. Because Thanks I a lot, David. A new one, and uh, I would like to 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 add that to the to the version you will share. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks a lot. We will uh, we will upload the, the latest version together with the recording after uh, today or tomorrow thanks a lot for for participating thank you very much for this uh, this opportunity it's very i think it's very important okay yeah i think it was really a great uh, a great session for for the participants there's really a lot of people out there who don't know about the scrums so it's uh, it's great to to share okay thank you and bye bye, -bye. Right. Anna, if you think that the statistics in the first step one, step two could be useful, I think maybe we can ask and get them, get the statistics, their success rate in step one, step two. Of course, the, the numbers are not high here. We speak about, uh, you know, 50 um, cases, but uh, we can try to get the statistics. Can we maybe in the future it can be useful? Look, I think... Uh, having some statistics is always useful. Actually, also for our answer was super, super interesting uh, to see our statistics about Chinese applicants and those who success successfully applied also from China. And we're going to try to, to find them because it's, it's really great, I think, for, for applicants uh, to, to hear successful stories, especially of country fellows. 
So, um, so yeah, if it's um, yeah, if it's possible, it would be very nice to to have the statistics, and then we will uh, you know go back to the to the group of the participants and share also this information. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, really. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Have a good day.